So good evening and welcome to our ERS webinar tonight. My name is Axel Wolf from the Medical University of Graz in Austria. And it is a great honor to welcome you um, to, together with my co-moderator, Tiago Soares -Sant Santos, to our session tonight. First of all, I would like to thank our sponsor Olympus who made these sessions possible. That today's topic will be the second part of our rhinology emergencies that keep you awake during on-call um, ERS junior webinar. The session will last about one hour and I would like especially welcome our speakers tonight. Um, we will start with Zinovia Zinaslanidio from Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. She will give us our first talk about acute complications of chronic rhinosinusitis. The second talk will be held by Professor Mario Turio Zanoni from um, Varese. University of Insubia in Italy. He will talk about acute dacryocystitis. Is surgery indicated in an emergency setting? And of course, a great honor to welcome Professor Sarah Weiss from Emory, Emory University in Atlanta. And we are looking forward to her talk about invasive fungal sinusitis. When should it be suspected? During our session, please feel free to ask questions with our Q&A function. We will try to discuss them at the end of our session altogether. So let's start with Zinovia. Can I ask you to share your screen? And we are looking forward to your presentation. Yes, hello, uh, I'm sharing the screen. <clears throat> Okay, I think we can all see it. Is it okay? Yes, just the presentation mode and then. Okay, perfect. Thank Before you. the invitation, we will be talking about the acute complications of chronic rhinosinusitis. In EPOS 2020, there, is, there are three main categories of ARS and CRS complications. It's, they are the orbital ones, met at 60 to 80 percent of cases, the endocranial up to 15 and 20% of cases, and the osseous one, uh, the rarest one, up to 10% of complications. Since the topic of this, um, this presentation is the complications of CRS, I'm gonna make a special reference to the mucosils and the fungal rhinosinusitis. And uh, also in EPOS 2020, you see a table of unusual complications of acute bacterial rhinosinusitis or chronic rhinosinusitis. What is really interesting is that in the literature, you don't actually have many data about the underlying condition in the, in the complications. You don't actually distinguish between acute rhinosinusitis and chronic rhinosinusitis. And in cases of chronic rhinosinusitis complication, if you don't distinguish, they don't distinguish between nasal polyposis or not. So uh, we move on to the incidence. The incidence of complication is approximately three cases every 10, uh, 100,000 per year in the general population and three to 20% in hospitalized patients. There is a male predominance and the precipitating factors are acute bacterial rhinosinusitis in children and chronic rhinosinusitis in adults. What's really important and is underlined in EPOS 2020 is that the use of oral antibiotics has not affected the incidence of, or, of complications of rhinosinusitis. Basically, what is seen is that the, the access to the healthcare system and the socioeconomic crisis may actually affect the increase in the incidence of the complications. So let's move and study its category. The orbital complications are classified, uh, we are following the classification of Chandler as used in EPOS 2020. There are five stages. You can see the preceptal cellulitis, the orbital cellulitis, stage two, the subperiosteal abscess, SPA, stage three, the orbital abscesses, stage four, and the cavernous sinus thrombosis, stage five. 
The Chandler classification has some drawbacks. The stage one is actually not an orbital complication, it's an eyelid infection solely. And stage five is basically an intracranial complication and not necessarily the end point of orbital complications. As far as the sinuses involved, we see that the commonest sinus is the ethmoids, followed by the maxillary sinus, the frontal, and last but not least, the sphenoid sinus. The infection runs through the dehiscent lamina papyracea or through the valvous venuses of the orbit. And what's really important is that the pneumococcal conjugate has led to a decrease in the hospital admissions, but not a decrease in the incident of, of orbital complications. This is a table based on the EPOS 2020 guidelines. The preceptal cellulitis has some clinical signs as, such as eyelid edema. We can perform or not perform a CT scan and the treatment is conservative by oral antibiotics. The cases of orbital cellulitis are characterized by proptosis, hemosis, possible diplopia, ocular pain and tenderness. The imaging um, proposed is a CT with contrast and the treatment is intravenous antibiotics. Then we go on to the stage three, the SPAs that uh, follow the clinical characteristics of orbital cellulitis, plus ophthalmopegia, impaired visual acuity, basically impaired color vision, high fever and increased white blood cells. We confirm the diagnosis with a CT with contrast and possibly perform an MRI if we consider we suspect a concomitant intracranial complication. Here in the SPAs is the main change between EPOS 2012 and EPOS 2020. We propose in EPOS 2020 the conservative treatment and re-evaluation of the patient after 24 to 48 hours, possible proceeding to surgical treatment if there is no response to the first treatment. The orbital abscesses is the stage four, is characterized by ophthalmoplegia and impaired visual acuity that can be up to blindness. We can have a CT with 3D reconstruction, a possible MRI. The treatment is solely surgical with endoscopic sinus surgery and possible utilization of open approaches. So what we must have in mind is that the CT and MRI scans can be false negative to a percentage of 10 to 15 percent. It's a high percentage of false negative results. And what also EPOS 2020 underlines is that we need to consult an ophthalmologist once or twice a day, not only for clinical, but also for medical legal reasons. He must objectively assess the proptosis, the orbital pressure, the visual acuity, color vision, and eye movement. As ENTs, we must remember that the first color to be misconcepted is the red color. That's what the first color we lose. And we have nine to 10 hours to decompress the orbit in order to avoid permanent damage to the optic nerve. Here you see some three CT scans of patients from our department, a preceptal cellulitis, a subperiosteal abscess, an orbital abscess with air inside the orbit, a carvenous sinus thrombosis and MRI with low flow on the right. And here's the case of an SPA with false negative CT scan. There was a female adolescent presenting with eyelid edema, ocular tenderness, diplopia, and the, the CT scan in the admission, you can see it here, so no evidence of an SPA. The patient was uh, administered and started intravenous treatment with antibiotics, had no response to the first 24 hours, so we proceeded to the total ethmoidectomy. And during the ethmoidectomy, we saw pus running out of lamina papyracea, so there was a drainage of the abscess at the same time. So to summarize the treatment strategies, stages one and two, go conservatively as they used to. Stage three goes conservatively based on the new guidelines and stage four goes surgically. The conservative treatment has the antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, decongestants and pain management. And the indications for surgical intervention are is the evidence of SPA or intraorbital abscesses on CT or MRI. Reduced visual acuity, reduced color vision, affected pupillary reflex, and progression and or no improvement of the orbital signs or the systemic signs of the general condition after 24 to 48 hours of intravenous antibiotics. The indication of conservative treatment for SPAs relies on some facts, clear clinical improvement within the, four, for the first day or the second day of intravenous antibiotics, no decrease in visual acuity, small size of the abscess, medial location, no significant systemic involvement, and two main age groups, children two to four years old, 
And later studies show that the same thing can be applied also in adults. So we have a case here of a 35 year old male with chronic renal sinusitis, ASA syndrome and a prior endoscopic sinus surgery. He presented with diplopia. The CT scan revealed protrusion of inflammatory material through the roof of the orbit and also a bony uh, diaphragm in the lateral view, uh, the lateral wall of the same frontal sinus. So we decided to proceed with a combined approach, a draft to be uh, drainage of the frontal sinus. You can see here the drainage of the frontal sinus and who's coming out. And also a mini trephination approach here with uh, actually having two holes and uh, having actually the good drainage of the abscess. The patient had preoperatively visual acuity of four out of 10 and postoperatively eight out of 10. What is really important in mucosils is the characteristic of bone remodeling. Basically, they're seen commonly in the frontal sinus, followed by the ethmoid, the sphenoid, and the rarest location is the maxillary sinus. That's why I present the case of a maxillary sinus mucosil presenting with diplopia and limited eye movement on the right. You can see the CT scan, the endoscopic view preoperatively with the protrusion of the lateral nasal wall. Endoscopically, we made an androstomy. The diplopia resolved immediately postoperatively, and the endoscopic view six months afterwards, so complete healing. The fungal venous on the sides, I'm not going to analyze on that because it's the topic of uh, Professor Weiss. And we're going to move on to the intracranial complications. We have the meningitis and cerebritis, the epidural and subdural empiemas, the brain abscess, and superior sagittal or cavernous sinus thrombosis. Mainly, the intracranial complications are seen in cases of CRS. Uh, there is a predominance of male adolescents, and the mortality rate raises up to 10 to 20 percent, still a high mortality rate. They are mainly associated with frontoethmoidal rhinosinusitis or sphenoidal rhinosinusitis. And the roots of transmission are through the diploid veins or by tissue continuity spread. What is really important to remember in intracranial complications is that the clinical signs are non-specific in the majority of the cases. We have headache, fever, nausea, and vomiting, and symptoms of ARS. Only in 40% of patients, we have neurological manifestations and signs of increased endocranial pressure. So we must always be alert and check our patients again and again and monitor them closely. In, in terms of imaging, you can perform a CT scan with contrast, but the cold standard remains the MRI. Combined or not with an MRA or MRV, if we suspect a cavernous sinus thrombosis or a sagittal sinus thrombosis. The intracranial complications require a multidisciplinary team. We need to work with a neurologist that will perform a lumbar puncture, assess uh, the uh, assess uh, the CNS infection in adults. The same thing will be done by a pediatrician in children. The neurosurgeon will decide whether to drain the abscess, the brain abscess. The ophthalmologist will examine the papilledema, and we will decide about the drainage of the sinuses. The basic principles are talking about intravenous antibiotics and corticosteroids. We have the drainage of the abscess if the abscess is more than 2.5 ml in volume. And an endoscopic sinus surgery will be used in combination with the drainage of the abscess and solely only in small volume epidural abscesses. The main pathogens comes from the Streptococcus group, with Streptococcus anginosus being the major pathogen. We can also find Staphylococcus and anaerobes. What is really important in the intracranial complications is the length of hospitalization. We have longer length of hospitalization in patients with localized neurological symptoms and seizures, and the shortest length of hospitalization in epidural abscesses, in cases of early endoscopic sinus surgery, and in cases where neurosurgeons and ENTs work together simultaneously at the beginning of the process. EPOS 2020 states clearly that lack of early endoscopic sinus surgery leads to repeated craniotomies and to longer length of hospitalization. Here you, I have a case of a 12-year-old male who was urgently administered to pediatric department with a CNS infection and comatosis. The CT scan and MRI revealed encephalitis and a brain abscess information. The neurosurgeon 
consulted us to perform a sinus drainage and uh, to treat the brain abscess conservatively. We perform a total lymphoidectomy on the left and a sphenoidotomy on the left. And we had intravenous antibiotics that distribute through the blood brain barrier and close monitor the patient. The patient relapsed the following days after the surgery and was transferred to the neurosurgical department and treated conservatively. He was discharged after 50 days with no neurological deficit. And to go on to the last category of complications, the osseous ones, we have the frontal sinus osteomyelitis, also known as spots puffy tumor, rarely located in the maxillary sinus, the osteomyelitis. The two transmission routes are the same, the hematological and the tissue continuity spread. The pathogens mainly rely on staphylococcus plus or minus anaerobes. And we confirm the diagnosis with a contrast enhanced CT scan. The treatment is frontal sinus drainage and long-term antibiotics over six weeks of antibiotics, which uh, and the possible osteoplasty of the frontal sinus. Here is a case of osteomyelitis in an adult patient, a 60-year-old female. Osteomyelitis of the frontal sinus in uh, um, chronic rhinosinusitis. This is the CT scan preoperatively. You can see the osteomyelitis of the frontal sinus. She was treated with obliteration of the sinus and then a reconstruction of the frontal sinus defect with a calvarian graft. In a paper published by our department in Rhinology in 2018, we actually showed that the calvarian grafts are a very good um, possibility, a very good choice in reconstructing anterior frontal wall defects. And by ending this presentation, I would like to thank you for your attention and remind you that ERS 2020 due to coronavirus has turned to ERS 2021, and we are all expecting you in Thessaloniki in September. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zinova, Zinovia, for, uh, for your great presentation. And I just want to, to remind the attendees that uh, questions are welcome and uh, we we need them too and uh, you should do that in the Q&A section um, now I think we are going to move to uh, Professor Mario Turrizanoni he will talk about acute tacrocystitis uh, is surgery indicated in an emergency setting you can move on uh, Mario if you want Well, okay. good night, everybody. It's really a pleasure and honor to be with you once again for the European Rhinologic uh, Society webinar meeting. And uh, the topic I'm gonna talk uh, tonight is acute dacrocystitis. That uh, is uh, not uh, so rare condition that you can encounter during your on call in daily clinical practice. Well, as you know, Acute dacrocystitis is a supportive inflammation of a lacrimal sac, mostly secondary to primary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction. It is defined as a medical urgency because it's characterized by a rapid onset of pain, erythema, and swelling, classically below the medial cantal tendon, with or without a pre existing epiphora, and mainly resulting from an acute infection of the lacrimal sac and all the tissues around. Orbital complication may occur, uh, but also they, they are rare and uh, they can have also some catastrophic consequences. Such complication may include uh, uh, cellulitis of the orbit, subperiosteal abscess of the orbit, but also intraconal or extraconal orbital abscesses and possibly uh, optic neuropathy with risk of visual disturbances. Uh, in, an, in an anecdotal case report by Schmidt and colleague, even a superior ophthalmic vein thrombosis was described after an acute dacrocystitis with the potential of a spread of the infection in deep intracranial spaces via septic cavernous sinus thrombosis. So it's really an 
emergency. You have to manage such situation quickly. And what is the standard of management, the standard of care? Well, traditionally, the conventional treatment includes systemic antibiotics uh, combined whenever feasible, also with steroid intravenously, warm compresses locally, and also a skin incision for drainage of the pus. And after the resolution of the acute infection, you can perform lacrosystorhinostomy using usually external approach. However, such a kind of standard of management can have some complication that may include uh, recurrent infection, so recurrent episodes of, of uh, acute dacrocystitis, uh, cutaneous fistulization because of a skin wound related to the skin incision for the drainage of the pus, and also some problem inside to the lacrimal sac, such as scarring tissue, some granuloma formation inside to the lacrimal sac, and so as a consequence, you can have some uh, uh, increased risk of dacrocystorhinostomy failure when you treat um, with dacrocystorhinostomy your patient once the acute inflammation has been resolved. Uh, recently, uh, the, uh, per, the, the dacrocystorhinostomy performed in an acute setting, uh, also called the primary acute dacrocystorhinostomy, has been proposed in alternative to a secondary procedure after the acute infection has been resolved. And also there is this single tertiary care um, randomized controlled trial that compare primary versus secondary uh, dacrocystorhinostomy and they found more or less no differences uh, between the two uh, policy in terms of recurrency, safety and outcomes. Uh, however, uh, immediate uh, dacrocystorhinostomy is emerging as an, a, a good option in, the, in treating such kind of condition. Why? Basically, because you can get to your patient an early and definitive resolution of the acute infection and also relief, immediate relief of pain. You can also manage such kind of situation with a single stage procedure without further hospitalization because you not need to perform another hospitalization to your patient in a second time once the acute inflammation has been resolved. You can also reduce the hospitalization stay because your patient has not to stay in the hospital too many days for intravenous therapy. You can do the procedure and the day after the surgical procedure, the patient can be discharged home with uh, medical therapy uh, per os, and also uh, by managing immediately in the acute setting uh, the situation using the dacrocystorhinostomy, you can also reduce the risk of orbital and intracranial complication. And the second, so acute dacrocystorhinostomy, I mean, dacrocystorhinostomy performed in an acute setting can be a very good option. And what kind of technique you can use external dacrocystorhinostomy or endoscopic endonasal dacrocystorhinostomy. Well, uh, this single center comparative study uh, with two harms have compared external versus endoscopic uh, procedure and they have found more or less comparable results uh, for dacrocystorhinostomy uh, using the two different technique. However, uh, I think that dacrocystorhinostomy uh, using an endoscopic in the nasal technique and performing an acute setting can have some advantages. And I've tried to summarize the advantages of uh, endoscopic in the nasal dacrocystorhinostomy in an acute setting. Well, first, you can perform a safe surgery during an acute infection, because as you know, Endoscopic endonasal dacrocystorhinostomy allows exposure and opening of the lacrimal sac on the nasal side, reducing dissection in an infected and inflamed soft tissue of the medial canthus. Moreover, uh, the absence of facial skin incision is another advantage, uh, also because this, the risk of skin fistulization uh, can result in undesirable scar tissue at the level of a medial canthus. Uh, and so by performing an endonasal procedure, you can decrease such kind of risk. Uh, moreover, an immediate intervention can decrease also the risk of the acute orbital complication. And moreover, you can reduce the risk of cellulitis, subperosteal abscesses, 
Uh, another important thing is that by performing the procedure by endoscopic Indonesian approach, you can also um, avoid disrup disruption of the medial cantal tendon complex, which is intimately involved in the normal lacrimal pumping activity. Uh, and so you can preserve the pump activity of a lacrimal system, of a lacrimal pathway by performing the, the procedure by the endonasal side. And also during the endonasal endoscopic endonasal procedure, you can also correct some other simultaneous synonasal abnormalities. Uh, the endoscopic endonasal dacrosistorhinostomy in the acute setting is emerging as a very good option for managing such a kind of situation. Uh, as demonstrated also by English literature, you can see, and this is uh, some reports available in literature uh, describing the successful rates of uh, um, in, the, in terms of uh, no recurrences, uh, very good cosmetic outcomes, very fast recovery of the condition has been described starting from 2001. Uh, to um, as far as the more recent series in 2014 and 2017. So uh, such kind of uh, therapeutic option is emerging as very valid alternative in the acute setting. And so I would like to give you some technical notes how to perform endoscopic endonasal uh, dacrosystostomy, uh, especially in the acute setting. Well, as you know, uh, first you have to exactly understand the landmark to identify the duct, uh, the nasolacrimal duct, but also the uh, sac in from the endonasal side. Well, you can have in mind the axilla of the middle turbinate, I mean the lateral insertion of the middle turbinate of the lateral nasal wall, and uh, the lacrimal sac is just a little uh, below and, and up to this axilla. Uh, to keep in mind, you can Remember, one third up to the axilla of the middle turbinate, two thirds below the axilla of the middle turbinate. And also in lateral or lateral projection, you can keep in mind the position of the uh, axilla, ma maxillary line. Uh, along the maxillary line, you can see that the mm, sac, the lacrimal sac, is just uh, one third below the maxillary line and two thirds up to the maxillary line. So your landmark to keep in mind is the maxillary line and the ins lateral insertion, also called axilla of a middle turbinate. This way you can exactly identify the projection uh, of the lacrimal sac. In our uh, center, we perform usually a CT scan before surgery in order to exactly understand the anatomical conformation of the ethmoid and ethmoid complexes, because it's important to understand preoperatively the insertion of the using process on the lacrimal bone or in, or in the lacrimal sac, because there is a, a wide variability of the insertion of the using process on the lacrimal sac. Another thing that we have to check before surgery is the pneumatization of the agar nasi cell because uh, re, uh, in relation to the uh, pneumatization of the agar nasi cell, and sometimes you have to open the agar nasi cells in order to approach the lacrimal sac. In other cases, not required. So please keep in mind to check on the CT scan preoperatively of your patient. First, the insertion of the using the process Second, the level of pneumatization of the agronasi cells. In this way, you can safely disassemble the anterior ethmoid structures in order to approach directly on the lacrimal sac. And this is uh, an anatomical video. We have performed such kind of anatomical video in our dissection lab in order to uh, emphasize the landmark. Well, this is the axilla of the middle turbinate, one third up, two third below. And usually we perform, uh, we harvest such a kind of flap, mucosal flap, because we would like to preserve the mucosa in this area because the mucosa in this area is really important to avoid scar tissue formation after, after the procedure. And so we harvest such a kind of flap, we elevate this flap yeah, along using a subperiosteal dissection, we elevate the flap, we exposed the bone, and then we remove the bone. 
But you see, we can store the flap in the upper part of the nasal cavity uh, in order not to destroy the flap during surgery. Uh, after that, we can remove the bone uh, using a, a chisel, also using a drill uh, in order to expose the lacrimal sac. You can see we are drilling the bone, we are exposing the lacrimal sac. Pay attention not to expose the nasolacrimal duct. Nasolacrimal duct is below, but your procedure should be performed up at the level of the nasolacrimal sac in order to decrease the failure rates. If you open the nasolacrimal duct, your failure rates increase. And also in case of acute dacrocystitis, you are not able to marsupialize the sac and to drain the pus. So you have to open the sac, not the duct. And so you have exactly to identify the position of the sac. You can see once the sac has been approached, we cut the medial wall of the sac, and then we, uh, we fold outside the wall of the sac in order to promote the healing and prevent restenosis of the sac. You can see the medial wall of the lacrimal sac has been completely cut and has been rotated, folded outside in order to increase the possibility to patency of the lacrimal sac. After the procedure, we can also some, we perform also some rinses, washing of the lacrimal system. We, we, you can encanulate your lacrimal pathway and you can perform washing, you can see, and this is the stand inside. Uh, well, so first things in order to prevent recurrences as, is to harvest some mucosal flap and place the mucosal flap to cover the bone in order to prevent scar tissue formation and stenosis of the opening. Related to the uh, stand positioning, uh, there is some uh, randomized trial. There are, there are also some meta-analysis that uh, emphasize that put stand or not put stand, more or less same results. And so in our policies, we, in our institution, our policy is that not you to use the stand as a standard procedure, but we use stand only in revision cases. Same things also regarding to the mitomitin, mitomitin C that uh, in some studies has been applied in order to prevent restenosis. Well, we do not use mitomitin C. We do not use uh, stent as a standard procedure. Usually in first surgery, we perform only the dacrocystorhinostomy. We open the sac and we harvest the flap. In this way, recurrence rate can be very low. I would like to close my presentation only showing a clinical case. This was a lady, 80, or 80 years old lady with a dacro, acute dacrocystitis and we have performed surgery. Uh, you can see first we have harvested the flap. We have harvested the flap in this way as shown in the anatomical dissection. We have stored the flap in the upper part of the nasal cavity. We have exposed the bone. You can see the projection of the sac, two third below the axilla, one third up to the axilla. We have completely removed the bone. This is the sac. We are pressing, we are pushing the sac from outside, of course, in order to exactly identify the sac. After that, we can cut the medial wall of the sac. We have encanulated we have incannulated uh, the lacrimal system only to push against the sac in order to be sure that we are exactly in a good position. We have performed an incision at the level of the sac and all the purulent material come outside. So we are exactly in the good position. We are in the, in the position of the sac. Please remember not to open the duct, but exactly open the sacs in order to reduce the risk of restenosis. And then you can see we have folded outside the medial wall of the sac. We have rotated outside and we have completely removed the medial wall of the sac, of the lacrimal sac. And this is the, and finally we have, uh, we have covered the exposed bone using our uh, flap in order not to leave the nuded bone and reduce the risk of restenosis. You can see, well, a part of the flap 
behind, a part of the flap up, a part of the flap down, all around covered by the mucosa. No exposed bone in order to reduce risk of restenosis. And you can see this is the, the one-year postoperative control that complete remucosalization of the cavity and good patency of the lacrimal sac. So in conclusion, uh, acute dacrocystitis should be considered as an, an emergency, as an emergency, and prompt combination of medical and surgical therapy uh, represent the gold standard. And please keep in mind that uh, primary endoscopic endonasal dacrocystorhinostomy could be a very good option uh, to manage such a kind of situation. Thank you very much for your attention. Mario, thank you very much for this excellent presentation and with a lot of tips and tricks for the practical life. I really appreciated your talk. Again, if there are any questions, just send it to us via the Q&A function. And it is a pleasure to give over to our next speaker, Professor Weiss. Um, yes, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and make sure that the presentation comes up yes, appropriately. Yes, perfect, you thank you. Me? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's my honor to be with you all this evening. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about acute invasive fungal rhinosinusitis. And unfortunately, this presentation will not have nearly as much purulence and um, excellent drainage of pus as the last two presentations did. But this is certainly an emergency situation that um, we can potentially see as rhinologists. And I'll, I will also try to give you a few tips throughout the presentation um, based on my experience and some of the literature. I do want to mention that uh, a lot of this information is nicely summarized in the recent international consensus statement on allergy and rhinology rhinosinusitis 2021 update, which is available as an e-publication uh, for free download. So we're gonna look at some of the endoscopic, radiographic and pathologic findings of acute invasive fungal sinusitis. Um, we'll talk a bit about the immune status and how that plays into this process. And we'll also talk about some of the treatment modalities. So there are various types of fungal rhinosinusitis, and I think we're all fairly familiar with these. This talk is primarily going to be based on acute invasive fungal sinusitis, although at the end I'll mention the chronic granulomatous variety just uh, for a bit of comparison. So acute IFS is rare, aggressive, and often fatal, and is really diagnosed based on the identification of fungal hyphae in tissue. Uh, and this invasion, invasion results in thrombosis and progressive necrosis. And it's typically a very acute process, although it's defined as having less than a month of symptoms. So it's interesting that fun, fungi are ubiquitous in the environment. And it's really the breakdown of our normal immune mechanisms that can allow invasion in uh, an immunosuppressed patient. So as we look at the continuum of immune status, uh, ranging from immunocompetent here um, in the middle to immunosuppression on the right, and then uh, atopy, which can be thought of as an, a, sort of an overactive immune system in some ways, we can see how some of these various fungal entities fit on the continuum. And it's our acute invasive fungal sinusitis that really occurs at that maximum amount of immune suppression. So immune suppression can occur in various different forms. I think the two classic ones that we think about are highlighted with asterisks here in the form of diabetes with metabolic acidosis, especially. Uh, and it's the hyperglycemia and acidosis that actually enhances the tissue invasion. And then in our hematologic patients, either those with hematologic malignancies, uh, especially those undergoing active chemotherapeutic regimens, or perhaps the patients that have undergone some type of bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant, 
and have that uh, immune suppression re uh, in relation. Those are the ones that we oftentimes think about, but we can also see invasive fungal sinusitis in patients that are on very high doses of corticosteroids and sometimes in solid organ transplant patients. We often look for neutropenia and uh, specifically an absolute neutrophil count of less than 500, but I would, I would wanna highlight that we need to also consider functional neutropenia as well. So it may not be just the neutrophil count alone that uh, signifies immunosuppression, but in certain cases, the count uh, can be normal or even high, and it, but it's that the neutrophils are not functioning well. Epidemiology of acute invasive fungal sinusitis is a little bit difficult to quantify. There are some studies that have put some numbers in the literature, uh, and you can see those at the bottom of the slide. There have also been some recent comments about some increases in invasive fungal disease, and this has potentially been linked to increased use of immune modifying drugs, higher prevalence of diabetes in the population and, uh, and the aging population. So there are certain signs and symptoms that uh, we may look for, and these are not necessarily specific to invasive fungal sinusitis, but, um, but some of them may point us in that direction, especially when combined with an immunocompromised history. So things like sinus pain or pressure, uh, nasal obstruction, and especially numbness or vision changes. And th those can be some very significant and worrisome signs. On exam, we can often see some uh, edema. Fever may be present, although that may be suppressed in people that are uh, immunocompromised. The findings of decreased sensation, altered extraocular motility, decreased vision, and then any pallor or ne necrosis of mucosa uh, would also be worrisome. On nasal endoscopy, um, there are a couple of things that, that we will look for early in the course of disease. Sometimes we can just see edema. And so really it's the uh, having that heightened suspicion for this process that's gonna be important. Pallor and necrosis are also important signs, uh, as well as the ability of the patient to sense uh, the physical touch or manipulation. Uh, and so oftentimes in these patients, we'll want to avoid placing any anesthetic uh, so that you can appropriately assess whether they're, they're able to sense um, touch or pain. On nasal endoscopy, if you see things like um, crusts like this, uh, we'll oftentimes want to remove those in order to examine the underlying mucosa and see if that is uh, pale or insensate. Um, these crusts can be potential signs of necrosis. And so we really kind of wanna get down to the, the mucosa underneath. When we biopsy, typically uh, I'll, instruct our residents and uh, fellows in training to biopsy at the edge of the uh, necrotic or pale area and then an area of normal mucosa and we can see how that we'll see how that's important when we look at some pathology pictures. On radiology, um, the group at our institution several years back um, published a study that looked at radiology findings, especially early findings in invasive fungal sinusitis. And one of the things that our radiologists and, and our um, otolaryngologists often look for is this increased mucosal thickening within the nasal cavity. So along the septum along and along the nasal floor. And this is not something that we will routinely see in chronic or acute sinusitis um, in a routine manner. So an immunocompromised patient with these findings would give us a heightened suspicion for invasive fungus. The bone erosion that you often hear about, orbital involvement, retroantral fat pad thickening, um, those occur typically later on in the disease process. On MRI, it's been noted that loss of contrast enhancement can predict disease involvement as well. And you can see some examples of that uh, over here on the right. MRI can also be important to evaluate intracranial and intraorbital disease, as well as to follow patients after initial surgery. 
I think uh, most of us in rhinology sort of realize that if we repeat CT scans after the patient has had surgery, we will see uh, pretty extensive mucosal thickening within the sinus cavities. And so subsequent imaging, often in the form of MRI scan, is used to follow any progression of uh, soft tissue disease, but, uh, such as within the orbit and intracranial. There have been a few other radiologic findings, especially on MRI, that have uh, potential association with invasive fungus, although oftentimes these uh, are not definitive. On pathology, uh, we wanna see fungal forms within the mucosa, submucosa, and especially in the blood vessels with associated thrombosis, that is diagnostic. I think for many of us who have taken um, board exams or um, credentialing examinations, we're often asked about things like um, septations and uh, degree of branching of, of fungi. And here you can see examples of aspergillus and mucormycosis, which are some of the more common forms of invasive fungus and some pathology examples of those. So to look a little bit closer at pathology, this is a biopsy example from an invasive fungal sinusitis patient. And you can see um, that this here on the left is some partially viable tissue. And then on the right, you see a much more background of uh, pink, and that is indicating necrosis in this particular patient. As we look a little bit closer, we can see the vascular channels as well as the lumen. And there are fungal forms highlighted by these black uh, triangles, and you can see that they are very diffuse throughout this particular example. Here is another example of a blood vessel wall and lumen, as well as a peripheral nerve with fungal forms highlighted. So there you can see that um, throughout those pictures, especially the first one, it's uh, important to try and biopsy at that uh, interface between what appears to be healthy and what appears to be uh, affected by the invasive fungus, and that will potentially give you some uh, increased ability to diagnose this. As far as treatment, um, surgical debridement of non-vascularized tissue is typically advocated, and that is in most cases going to be endoscopic, although some open procedures can uh, be added. In years past, oftentimes these procedures were quite deforming, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the extent of procedures here shortly. Sometimes some serial examinations and return to the operating room to see if additional debridement may be necessary. Uh, and, and then our additional sort of three-pronged approach includes treatment with antifungal medications, as well as reversal of the underlying immunodeficiency if possible. Antifungal medications are initially often based on histology and maybe a bit more broad spectrum. Cultures, intraoperative cultures are recommended and can help guide therapy. So as we think about surgical debridement, I mentioned that endoscopic sinus surgery is sort of our mainstay. We may add, add some extended endoscopic approaches and possibly even some open resection for very severe disease. And really the goal of treatment is to debride the necrotic tissue until we see bleeding. When we think about more significant and deforming operations, uh, such as orbital exoneration or maxillectomy, there is some literature to say that this may not necessarily improve survival and that some vision sparing modalities can confer uh, similar survival outcomes. So perhaps conservative orbital debridement or some retrobulbar uh, amphotericin injections. And those are things that uh, we have done at our institution as well. As far as antifungal therapy, it's very important to send cultures. Uh, I can remember when I was initially training, pretty much everyone got treated with amphotericin B and it was kind of a long course. But as some of the uh, azoles have come out in more recent years, these are can be a bit more targeted to certain species of fungi, such as uh, the mucormycosis or aspergillus. And so oftentimes if patients are uh, initially started on things like amphotericin, they will be transitioned to some of these azoles for their long-term treatment, uh, and there are some oral options available as well. 
As far as survival, um, it has been noted in the literature that one of the most important things is to try and correct the underlying immunodeficiency. And so if the patient is diabetic with uh, metabolic acidosis, that involves um, correcting the metabolic acidosis and controlling their hyperglycemia. Um, if the patient is neutropenic, um, certainly you know, there are potentially measures that can help control that. Uh, and kind of looking at the timeline of the patient uh, recovering from any acute chemotherapeutic regimen uh, is also important. Overall, the survival has been relatively stable for acute invasive fungal sinusitis in the last 20 years, although there are certain patients where the survival has increased substantially, and, and it's been noted that those with renal disease and leukemia may have increased survival. Uh, the largest series on acute invasive fungal sinusitis was published by Turner in 2013 and noted an overall survival of about 50%. And they uh, noted several different uh, predictors of either poor survival or improved survival. And you can see those here. It's interesting to note that um, diabetics were noted to have improved survival. And that's likely because uh, it's, it is a bit easier to correct their hyperglycemia and potentially metabolic acidosis compared to some of the patients that may have persistent neutropenia. So um, as I mentioned previously, I was just going to touch um, briefly on chronic invasive fungal sinusitis uh, just to show some of the comparisons. So this is going to be a bit more indolent spanning months to years and actually our institution has started to define sort of a subacute invasive fungal sinusitis that uh, starts at about a month or so. Um, but when we think about chronic IFS, it's more of a quasi immunocompetent patient. So they're going to have tissue invasion of the fungus, but um, they're going to lack the acute tissue necrosis. Um, and they, we can see a chronic inflammatory reaction and possibly granuloma for, uh, formation. These are not patients that are going to be treated um, as aggressively with a medical therapy. So usually they're not placed on amphotericin B, but they will receive um, surgery for a diagnosis and some initial debridement if possible, and then one of the azoles depending on culture. So this is an example of um, a more chronic variety of fungal sinusitis. And, and you can see that there is a background of kind of this general pink um, tissue. And in this particular case, this is not necrosis, but rather fibrosis. And you can also see some granuloma formation as well as um, some fungal forms highlighted here. On tissue stain, we can see granulomas that are highlighted by these white air arrows. Uh, and then the fungal forms highlighted by the yellow arrows. So I'd just like to close uh, by saying that various forms of fungal rhinosinusitis exist. I think we're all pretty much aware of this. And the presentation does depend on the immune status of the patient and that affects their treatment as well. Um, and one of the really, really the crux of recovery from acute invasive fungal sinusitis is trying to, as best we can, to correct the underlying immune compromise with surgical debridement and antifungal therapies um, added in there to kind of form the, the triangle of our treatment strategy. So uh, thank you all so much. I'm going to stop sharing and I anticipate we'll have some questions. Thank you for your amazing lecture, Professor Wise. I believe we have several minutes for one question or two. I will start with a question to uh, Professor Mario uh, regarding the use or not the stent in uh, decorous cystostomy in, uh, in primary surgery. And how long do you keep the, the stents? Yeah, it's a very good question because this is a, an open issue uh, data in literature are conflicting about this topic because some authors suggest stenting, other authors advise against stenting. So uh, there is not consensus in literature. Uh, 
I can say you our policy, the policy in our institution, we are not convinced that stent in primary surgery is useful. Also because the stent inside of a lacrimal sac may increase the risk of scar tissue formation, granuloma formation. Also in putting the stent, sometimes you can also have um, not good street to reach the sac. So usually in primary surgery, we do not use stenting in routine, as routine, as standard. We do not use mitomitin C as routine, as a standard. We reserve such kind of things only for revision cases. Uh, when we have failure of the of endoscopy diacrosystorhinostomy, but performing the flap, we have noted the very increased rates of success by performing the flap. So in our experience, the real difference is performing the flap and cover the denuded bone. These have lead to reduced risk of failure. When we have failure, 10, 15% of failure, you can perform a revision surgery with stent and mitomyotins. When we put a stent, usually we keep the stent, uh, bicanalicular stent, crowdfold type, bicanalicular stent for um, more or less three, four weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have, um, we have several questions, maybe Sinovia. Um, we got a question regarding the false negative CT and MRI images in superiostal abscess or orbital abscess. Do you think is it mainly a matter of, of radio radiologic imaging technique or a matter of the early performed radiological imaging in in real life? Basically, what's been in the, written in the literature is that it's because of the early performance of the CD scan, but we are really advised to do an early CD scan during admission of patients with uh, the implication of orbital complications. So we know that in the first two days of the formation of an abscess, you can actually have a normal CT or a very low enhancement of contrast, but th that doesn't change the strategy of treatment. Mm -hmm. nowadays. So you start on with conservative treatment and re-evaluate the patient yeah. again. So yeah. you basically focus on the fact of visual acuity and color vision. Exactly, exactly. So, so only perform the image. So it doesn't change. The consequence for your, for your, for your yes. treatment. Actually, if you, will, if you allow me, I have um, a last question for Professor Weiss. If uh, uh, how long do you keep the antifungal treatment after the, the surgical debridement? So uh, I have seen various lengths of antifungal treatment. We typically work in concert with our infectious disease uh, consultants. And um, I, in my experience, the least, the, the shortest amount of time that I have ever seen treatment is about six weeks. Uh, and you know, typically it's started as uh, an inpatient with intravenous therapy and then transitioned to uh, oral therapy as an outpatient. Um, for, uh, I've, I've seen people be treated for three months or even longer. And then for the chronic invasive fungal sinusitis, uh, it's often even longer than that. Um, and, you know, may have, may require several episodes of treatment, depending on how the patient's progression goes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's 8 PM. I believe it's time to close. Do you agree? Okay. It was a great pleasure to uh, to to co-host or to co-moderate co with uh, along with Dr. Wolf this uh, this webinar. I want to thank to to the, the amazing panelists that we have, also to the our uh, our sponsor Olympus and DRS, and of course to the audience. Audience, uh, nice evening, nice evening to everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.